Have your Bibles this morning. I invite you to open up to the Gospel of Luke and chapter 2. This morning, I want to begin by giving you a little bit of a warning. Uh, we are going to be covering massive doses of Scripture. Uh, so we're going to have our Bibles open, and hopefully um, I'll try to be as patient as I can be to give you time to get to the passages, because we're going to be seeing a lot today. I want to begin with a question, a contemplative thought, really. How often have you relied on a promise? Just think of that. I see <laughs> some people laughing. So, <laughs> so it's probably fair to say that there have been times in our lives when we have said or heard someone promise that they were going to do something, and when it comes to the time, all of a sudden they either don't show up or they f make a phone call and give a reason why they can't be there. Every single one of us right now have had experiences and every one of us knows that there are certain people that when they say they're going to do something, they do it. And it's very much of a blessing when you have those kind of folks in your life that no matter what it is, you can call on that person and if you ask for help, they're going to give it. It really is a sign of character. There are those that mean well. But the reality is that it is very difficult for some people to follow through. Promises made in marriage vows. Promises made to God in a moment of crisis. Promises made by a friend. And there really is nothing worse than relying on another person when they have promised you something and then find out when the moment comes to make good on that promise, they don't follow through. It doesn't take long before you figure out those who are reliable by what they say. And again, it is a blessing when you have people in your life that you know that you can count on. Listen to this. A story is told about Abraham Lincoln that he never indulged in drinking alcohol of any type, let alone testing it. It is said that once the president was offered a drink by one of the military colonels in the U.S. Army, and Lincoln turned down the offer saying that when his mother was on her deathbed, she had summoned him as a nine-year-old boy and asked for his promise that he would never take a drink or smoke. Lincoln then said, I promised my mother that I would not do that. And up to this hour, I have kept this promise. Would you advise me to break that promise? The colonel was asked by Lincoln. No, Mr. Lincoln, I wouldn't have you do that for the world to break the promise. It was one of the best promises that you ever made. I would give a thousand dollars today, the colonel said, if I had made my mother a promise like that and had kept it as you have done. That's the power of a promise. Great people make promises and keep the promises. Well, this morning we are going to look at such a promise and promises that have been given in Scripture. I came across something that I thought was interesting. Trust is like a paper. Once it's crumpled, it can't be perfect again. Trusting in people can be dangerous came across this proverb, look behind me, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 19. Putting confidence in an unreliable person in times of trouble is like chewing with a broken tooth or walking on a lame foot. Just let it sink in. Can you catch the imagery? I've had both of those happen, by the way. A tooth that's bad and you, and you bite on it and it sends you through the roof. Or a twisted ankle that when you put enough pressure on it, all of a sudden, it's just horrible. And I love the imagery because this is written by God through Solomon as he writes this. In other words, it's, it's very painful to put confidence in an individual who lets you down. All of the promises, though, folks, listen to this carefully, all of the promises in Scripture will certainly be fulfilled. 
There is not one thing, not one letter within all of Scripture that is ever proven not to be true. The book of Daniel is a book that many scholars have an issue with because all of the details that were written in Daniel in the succeeding generations of time throughout history have come true to the exact detail and so much so that they believe it was written afterwards. But God is a faithful God. He's the God of faithfulness whose every work is done in faithfulness. His faithfulness is a shield and a protection, by the way, for his people. Look at this next one, Psalm 91, verse 4. Look at this. I love the imagery. Speaking of God, he will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises, look at it, are your armor and protection. Everything that you need to go through life, everything that you have to have, to be able to protect yourself is live through the promise of God. Today we're going to learn of a man who had a promise of hope. And that hope is realized in his own life and that hope leaves him with peace. Let me set up the context to our message this morning. The context of today's story deals with what has already transpired on the arrival of the birth of Christ. Today we're taking a look at the fulfillment of one of the promises. In Jewish culture, it is interesting to know that on the eighth day, the baby is circumcised as part of the Abrahamic covenant. This baby is given the name Jesus. Jesus has now been taken to Jerusalem, and Jewish law demanded that he be presented to the Lord, kind of like what we would do in baby dedication They were to offer a sacrifice. Now, because of the fact that Mary and Joseph were poor, they didn't have to have a normal sacrifice. They were allowed to have birds instead of a lamb because of their poverty. And so there is an expectation of hope on the individual that we're going to be learning about today whose name is Simeon. And so we're going to look at an expectation of hope. We're going to see, folks, and I want you to take a look at a very familiar story, but I want it to be able to do something in relating to the context of your life individually this morning. A familiar story applied to a unique situation in our lives. And so what we're going to see is that Simeon's testimony concerning the Messiah is going to come through And Luke's account of Simeon's testimony about Jesus is going to reveal three things about Simeon and his message. The first thing I want us to look at is Simeon's character. Notice, if you will, beginning in chapter 2, verse number 25. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. Now look at carefully. He was a righteous and devout man person. He was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. And then we're told that the Holy Spirit was upon him. Again, this is a unique thing. This is still carrying over from the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit did not take up permanent residence at this point. You don't get that until Pentecost. And so at this time, you still see that the Holy Spirit was coming upon individuals. And here in this particular situation, all of a sudden, this guy who is declared righteous, the Holy Spirit has come upon him. By the way, Simeon, who only appears here in Scripture, lived in Jerusalem, and he was most likely a pretty old man. His his name means God has heard. God has heard, which, by the way, comes into play at this time of his life. Now, Luke is going to give us several indicators about this man, and I want you to notice it in your notes if you have them with you this morning. Number one, he was righteous, the text says, which means that he had a faith like Abraham. He was righteous because he believed in the promise. He believed in 
the Messiah that was coming. That was what declared him as righteous. Number two, the text says that he was devout. He was sincere about it. He was intense. And then thirdly, this is a big one, folks. He was eagerly waiting. Nobody that I know eagerly waits for much. We are living in a culture where we want it now. I don't want to have to wait for it. And yet, this is an individual who has been eagerly waiting for the Messiah. Being righteous and devout, by the way, is loaded with meaning. He was righteous. Believing promises, devout, being careful to obey and honor God. So that's his character. Let's take a look at his theology. The next thing we see in verse 25 is that he was again waiting. And I like the New American Standard. It renders that he was looking for the consolation of Israel. It's kind of a tricky word play. Let's take a look at what that means. It, the word consolation is interesting because it's the word parakalesis. Where have we heard that word before? The Holy Spirit, right? Specifically here, it's talking about the comfort or the encouragement or specifically the encourager. So the word consolation is a very important word in the text. It means that this individual was being comforted as he was expecting Messiah. And so the consolation was the comfort, encouragement that the Messiah would also bring. Now look at your notes. Simeon was both looking, now this is important, for the personal consolation of salvation for himself. And here's the next part for the national deliverance that was promised in the scriptures. The Davidic and Abrahamic covenants. Simeon was a man who cared deeply about his people. Listen to this. Simeon's concern for his people was highlighted by the distressing circumstances in which the nation found itself. They were chafing under the occupation of the hated Romans. Such trying times intensified the believing remnants longing for Messiah to come and deliver them. They yearned for deliverance from their Gentile oppressors, the restoration of their national sovereignty, the national blessings promised in the covenants. Once again, their, their expectation was something that was not realized with the understanding that it was not going to be a political takeover. This is going to be something in which he would understand for the first time that not only has Israel been oppressed by the Roman people, but more importantly, they have been oppressed by their own sin. And that there was a need for salvation. Again, even the disciples in the many years that they were with Jesus still did not fully understand the whole concept of Messiah's first advent. They were thinking of it as one event. And so here we have an insight that this individual Simeon is looking specifically at the consolation. They were awaiting the realization of the new covenant. Look at your notes with its promises. Number one of the forgiveness of sin a cleansed heart, and number three, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, look at those three things. Look at it in your notes. You would think that the disciples, the Pharisees, the Jewish teachers, that all of them would have understood that Messiah was to do all three of these things. Why would they have known, or why should they have known? Because the prophets had promised it. Hold your place in the book of Luke and turn with me to Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 31. Very important here because all of this describes these three things in detail. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning with verse number 31. Now I want you to listen to this very carefully as I read through it. Each word... 
as it relates to the promises. Verse 31, the day is coming. Now, if it says the day is coming, is it going to come? Absolutely. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel in Judah. Now, right there, a new covenant as compared to what? The old covenant. So they already should know that there's going to be something on the scene that's going to be different. This covenant will not be like the one that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. In fact, look what he says. They broke that covenant. Though I love them as a husband loves a wife, says the Lord. There's our imagery of marriage and salvation again. Verse 33, but this is the new covenant. Now notice all of the personal pronouns of I will. God says, I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. Think of that, by the way, with us, as we think of unsaved relatives saying that you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And here it is, I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. So this was a prophecy that gave them the understanding that, hey, there's going to be something different. This is not necessarily about keeping Torah or the regulatory laws or all of the Jewish rules and regulations. Something was going to be happening that was different. And here, folks, is one of the great promises that God gave to his people. The Messiah was the embodiment of the nation's hope of consolation. Simeon's theology was consistent with the Old Testament prophecies of God. And that brings us to see... Back to our text in Luke, Simeon's anointing. Here we see that Simeon is anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 26. It says that the Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, look at it carefully, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, this is going to meet up with Simeon. Let's think of this. Before the foundation of the world, before Simeon was even thought of, God had already prepared that he was going to have a divine intervention with Messiah as a baby. That he would come there and all of his hope would be realized. Do you realize that when, when God meets the expectation of his people, it gives him glory? When we are, are, are given the promises and we have the hope of those promises, do you realize that when that happens, when that transfer of our hope in the promise, God is glorified. God has built everything within Scripture to glorify himself. Every, every weave throughout the Bible is meant to give glory back to God. Your salvation, your desires, the gifts that he's given you, all of those things, when we exercise them, go back and give God glory. A revelation from God had granted a very unusual privilege to Simeon. And that revelation must have heightened his messianic hope to a fever pitch, knowing that it would happen in his lifetime. By the way, let me just take a quick time out. All of us here right now this morning are waiting. We're waiting for the next event in the prophetic calendar. We're waiting for the rapture of the church. We're waiting for the time in which we're going to actually see Jesus face to face. We're waiting for that. It hasn't happened. It's coming. 
no matter what it is we have, I don't care what sickness, disease, problem, it's still going to happen. And at that particular moment, all of your hope is going to be realized. That's what gets us through the day. That's what helps us to deal with the things that we face on a daily basis. We have the same expectation as Simeon did. And by the way, it was exciting because Simeon realizes it's going to happen in his generation. Do you realize that we may see the consolation of the Lord's second coming as we're alive this morning? It could happen before we leave here. It could happen tonight. It could happen at any time. The expectation that all of those promises, since we know they're going to happen, it's just a matter of when. So that anointing gave Simeon realized hope to keep him going. Look at your notes, three things. And again, this is going to be about what I just talked about. Look at number one, a constant state of joyous expectation. Number two, each new day brought him closer to the Messiah's arrival. Thirdly, the revelation motivated him to live a godly life. Now look at all three of those very carefully. A constant joyous expectation. Each day brings us closer to whenever Christ might come back. And that promise motivates us to live a godly life. Do you realize that those three things are true of us this morning at Woodville Community Church? All three of those we possess all three promises at this very moment. On the divinely appointed day, 40 days after Jesus' birth, Simeon came in the spirit into the temple. By the way, this was the temple complex, most likely, if you'll notice the next picture here, where the court of women was, that he met Joseph and Mary and Jesus. It would have been right in that bottom part there. That was the area, the location where this meeting takes place. It had to because Mary was a woman and he would meet them in this particular part of the complex. Which now brings us to the special revelation. Now we're going to hear the details that are going to come out of this Holy Spirit filled individual. Notice, if you will, the proclamation that he gives beginning in verse number 28. Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms. Imagine that. He praised God saying, now look at carefully, sovereign Lord. The sovereign describes the attribute of praise. Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have what? Promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared. By the way, prepared before the foundation of the world. For all people, he is a light to reveal God to the nations. The title of the sermon, he was a light of revelation. And he is the glory of your people, Israel, exclamation point. That means when he's holding this child, he cannot contain the praise and the worship that is inside of him. He is there saying, not only am I alive, not only is the promise fulfilled, but I'm actually holding on to this child so, Lord, you can do anything you want. It wasn't that he was close to death and he was almost on his deathbed. No, he's basically saying, Lord, since the promise is fulfilled, it doesn't matter if I die because it's all been taken care of. You've, you've made good on your promise. It's now all right because I am holding at this very moment this child. The revelation that has been given the hope is fulfilled, his joy is complete, his heart is at peace. Simeon was content to die. His own eyes had seen salvation personified in the infant Jesus. And then verse 32 packs a wallop of a promise. Look at your notes. A light 
to reveal God to the nations. Again, the New American, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. The word reveal or revelation is just exactly what you think it is. Look at this little Greek word. It's the word apocalypsos. And we know where that word comes from. That's the same word for the book of Revelation. And the definition is it's something that is made fully known. It's a full disclosure. It's something that has now been brought forth. It has now been given an answer. This statement uttered by Simeon, inspired by the Holy Spirit, quotes two very important Old Testament passages from the prophet Isaiah. Hold your place again in Luke and turn with me to Isaiah 49. Isaiah chapter 49. And notice, if you will, beginning at verse number 5. Isaiah chapter 49, verse number 5. And now the Lord speaks, the one who formed me in my mother's womb to be his servant, who commissioned me to bring Israel back to him, The Lord has honored me and my God has given me strength. He says, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will make you a light to the Gentiles. And you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. The Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel says to the one who is despised and rejected by the nations, to the one who is the servant of rulers, kings will stand at attention when you pass by. Princes will also bow low because of the Lord, the faithful one, the holy one of Israel who has chosen you. The servant's goal is the salvation and the restoration of God to Israel, the fulfillment of the covenant promise. By the way, how big is this covenant promise? It goes beyond our own day of the 21st century. How big is this promise that I just read? It has traveled from the time of Jesus as a little baby all the way past the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and some 2,000 years past the time right now and into the future. This promise, folks, is still hanging on the precipice of total fulfillment. Part of it is fulfilled. The rest is yet to come. And if the first part is fulfilled, guess what? The rest of it's going to be fulfilled. If the child has been chosen, and the child has been given then all of the promises will take place and you can't cut it short. The servant's goal was a covenant promise that went beyond our own day. And God will do this effectively in the tribulation after the conversion of the 144,000 witnesses. God begins the process of calling back his chosen people. I want you to see this, folks, because this moves into the future. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation in chapter 7. The book of Revelation. Can you believe that Bible prophecy deals with the first advent? Isn't that cool? Take a look at it. You wonder how God is going to work at getting his promise fulfilled of the Jewish people coming to faith. Chapter 7, verse 1, Then I saw angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, so that they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, carrying the seal, look at that, of the living God. That's speaking of salvation. He shouted to those four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea, Wait! Don't harm the land of the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. 144,000, not 144,001. 144,000 were sealed from all of the tribes of Israel. And you have them listed there. If, if, if you're not talking about detail, here it is. That's detail. 
So these 144,000 are going to be Jewish evangelists. Have you ever seen one Jewish evangelist before for Christ? They are on fire for the Lord. Can you imagine 144,000 of them? 144,000 on fire Jewish witnesses that will bring in the gospel message. You see how far reaching this message is for us today? All spoken by Simeon over 2,000 years ago. Simeon understood that salvation for Israel involved much more than national deliverance of the Romans. It was to take place in the millennial kingdom. So not only do we have a light to reveal God to the nations, but look at number two in your notes. For the glory of God's people. It is the glory of God's people. I want you to look at this carefully. Here, it is specifically speaking of his future people, his word of Israel. The word glory is an interesting word. It's the word doxa. We get our word doxology from this word. It means splendor, honor. It refers to honor which is accorded to someone. The splendor which characterizes a person or a thing. It's the great doxology of God's people. The Hebrew word is the word kabod, and it means glory. The statement about glory deals with the nation of Israel. Listen very carefully, folks. The glory spoken of here is not glory in the sense of physical victory over Rome or even over Israel, over Palestine and Gaza. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the future glory of God reclaiming his people. In fact, look behind me. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 13. For I am ready to set things right, not in the distant future, but right now as he begins it. I am ready to save Jerusalem and show my what? My glory to Israel. Look at Isaiah 45, 25. In the Lord, look at it, all the generations of Israel will be justified and in him they will boast. That happens in the book of Revelation. When it talks about all the generations of Israel, it speaks about all of God's chosen Jerusalem people. All the ones he knew before the foundation of the world. When Jesus comes on the scene to begin his ministry, we see the fulfillment of Isaiah's promise. Turn over to Matthew chapter 4, the Gospel of Matthew. And notice chapter 4, beginning with verse number 12. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 12. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, then left there and moved to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Nebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled, look at it, what God had said through the prophet Isaiah. Now look at it. In the land of Zebulun and Naphtali beside the sea beyond the Jordan River in Galilee where so many Gentiles live, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who live in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's the fulfillment. Jesus is being referred to as the great light. By the way, take a look at another promise from Isaiah looking into the future. Isaiah chapter 60 behind me. Arise, Jerusalem, let your light shine for all to see, for the glory, there's our word, of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come and see your radiance, your glory, manifestation. The awesome privilege. For Israel, salvation is glory. The manifestation of God's presence now to dwell with man. You remember, folks, Israel had a tabernacle? 
the feasts and festivals which pointed to Messiah, the Shekinah glory that was seen in their history, all of these shadows would find their fulfillment in an infant. Back to our text in Luke. With each confirmation of their son's true identity, Joseph and Mary's astonishment grew. Look at verse 33. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Their son, in every sense, a normal human baby, was the divine savior of the world. The Messiah who would fulfill all of the Old Testament promises of salvation and blessings. Now listen carefully. With the anointing, with the disclosure of who this great light is, as Mary and Joseph are standing there with Simeon holding their child, he's now going to give them a warning. He now has some things that he has to say. And he finishes his proclamation. He turns to the young couple and he blesses them and he warns them. Look at verse 34. Then Simeon blessed them and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child, and I would underline the next two words, is destined. Is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. Now look at this. Look at the beginning of verse 35. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Stop there. This child is going to come into the world. And when he comes into the world, he is going to disclose the true intentions of people's hearts. He's going to show those that are legitimate in their faith. And he's going to show others that do not have a real faith. There's going to be only two people. Well, actually, there's only two things you can do with the good news. You can either accept it or reject it. Accepting it means a lot more than just believing it. It means to appropriate it into every facet of your life. To not do that is to reject it. And it says that this person, this Messiah, is going to be the one that begins to start separating the hearts of God's people. And all throughout Scripture, we see that glorious illustration of wheat and tares going through and and making sure that the good doesn't get torn up with the bad. This is an amazing thing. And and, and that's why Mary and Joseph are amazed. They're amazed because they're trying to figure all of the details out of how this works. This must have hit Mary and Joseph very hard because Simeon starts declaring the opposite of joy and comfort. He reveals God's word of future consequences. By the way, the warning involved four specific results. I want you to see them in your notes The warning means that, number one, Jesus, the Messiah, would face opposition. That's the first thing. By the way, many people didn't think Messiah was going to face opposition except Rome. They didn't know it was going to be his own people. Remember, he came to his own and his own did not recognize him. Number two, it would culminate in his his rejection by the nation. They will reject him. Number three, only a remnant would rise. Number four, Jesus would bring separation, a fall. In Jesus' ministry, he himself would declare this truth, by the way. If you look behind me, you'll see in Luke chapter 12, verse 51, some very shocking words of Jesus. Do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? Yet, don't we sing that at Christmas? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. It seems like this is the opposite, right? Do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? No. I have come to divide people against each other. What in the world's going on with that? Jesus is saying, listen, you don't understand. When you become saved, when you become a Christian, there's going to be division. There's going to be people that hate you. 
Look at John 3.36, the next text. Anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. There's only two types of people, those that receive grace and those that receive judgment. And by the way, both of them show God's character of holiness. Listen to this. Not only would Gentiles be saved, but also some Jews would stumble over him and fall into judgment and perdition. Only the believing remnant would rise to eternal life in heaven. Jesus would be the determiner of people's destiny. Did you know that? Again, let's turn over to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. John chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. John makes this very, very clear, by the way, and also in his epistles as well. But look at here in verse 9. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Now look at this. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth, look at it, that comes from God. Salvation comes from God. Look at your notes. A person's relation or attitude comes toward Jesus. It seals their eternal destiny. However you And whatever you do with Jesus will seal your destiny. We learned that in Luke 16 with the rich man and Lazarus. Look at the arrows. Some would choose to accept him by God's sovereign grace. That's important. Even Israel, in spite of all our religious advantages, would harden their hearts. There would be a sharp division between those who reject Jesus, which, by the way, was the vast majority and those who would welcome and embrace him. Jesus would be a sign which represented his glory with the Father. And because of Jesus, men and women would declare the intentions of their hearts by what they do, whether they are for him or against him. Listen to this carefully, folks. It goes back to this, the same old thing. Randy and I talk about this quite a bit when it deals with salvation. The only way a person is saved is by their fruits and by their actions. I don't care what they think. I don't care what they say. We care about what they do. The idea is is that Jesus gives the warning there are many people who believe in the sense of believing. By the way, just believing the information makes you qualified to be a devil. Did you know that? Because the Bible says even the devil believes. So the difference is, is that it's what I do with the belief. It's, do I put it into practice? Am I living it out day by day, moment by moment? Or am I hiding? By the way, that's always a good sign there is hiding. Sin always hides. And when it's confronted, it gets mad. Why does it get mad? Because self wants to justify itself in any way it can to live with the guilt. It's tough stuff. The reality is, is this is, this is what Jesus is saying. It's about salvation. He's talking about the reality of how important it is to make sure. And this is it. Now notice the parenthesis of Simeon's statement, the rest of verse 35 back in the text. This, of course, is the heart-wrenching part. Look at the rest of verse 35. And a sword will pierce your very soul. If I could take the construction of those Greek verbs, it is the most horrific type of pain and piercing because it doesn't just involve the physical flesh. It involves the penetration of the heart. And only those of you who have experienced deep heartache would understand this. The death of a child the death of a spouse. That's the only kind of piercing, and those are the only kind of individuals that will truly understand this. A sword will pierce your very soul. There aren't even any words to express what it's like. 
to have that kind of loss. The New American Standard renders it, a sword will pierce even your own soul. Besides the obvious heart pain Mary would experience with the death of her son, it also is referring to the passion of Christ. Mary was there when her son was crucified. The word for sword there literally refers to a long sword. It could also be translated a spear. Think of Mary standing at the foot of the cross when the centurion took a spear and put it into the side of her son. What did she feel? Obviously, she didn't feel the cold blade of steel penetrating her own skin, but she felt it in her very soul. There it is. That's, that's the event. You almost need to take a deep breath after something like that. But I think there's some practical lessons that we can take away from this. In contrast to those who rejected Jesus when they saw his work, Simeon knew when he had seen none of the promises fulfilled or the miracles that would come. He knew that this baby was the Messiah. And he testified to that glorious truth. The problem for most people who reject Christ's offer of salvation is found in their desires. Take a look behind me in John chapter 3, verse 19. Listen to these words. Look what Jesus says here. The judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light. That's why people choose to sin. For their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear that their sins will be exposed. You see that? They stay away from anything that will confront them. Let me just say this. I need confrontation. I need people to be able to hold me accountable. I need people to be able to get in my face. Because it's usually my wife, <laughs> which is a good thing. God bless my wife for being able to do that. Because if we didn't have it, folks, if we didn't have confrontation, that's why the church was built the way it's built. That's why being part of a church body is so important. Because we can't do it alone. So three practical lessons that we can gain from this narrative this morning. Number one, I love this, God's sovereignty. We always go back to that. God's sovereignty gives us hope. When God's sovereignty is recognized in our lives, there comes a consolation to our hearts. We become Christians who have peace because we know God's promises to deliver us and be with us in our struggles. Sovereignty means that God's got it taken care of, that we don't have to fret about it, that we don't have to worry about it. And that should give us hope. I think about that with the whole things that are going on, whether it's government and politics, whatever it might be, the reality is, is God is sovereign. Nobody's going to out-plan God. No one's going to be able to out-decree God. It just goes according to his timetable. Number two, waiting on God is the rule, not the exception. Trusting in God's sovereignty will involve waiting. The best promises are those we have to wait for. Waiting develops the perseverance, the hupomone that Paul calls it, that is needed to deal with tomorrow's challenges. We need that. Then number three, salvation obviously is not a human achievement, but a divine gift. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Verse 30 says, your salvation, which you, God has prepared. Salvation is supernatural. You cannot earn it. You can't work for it. It is something that God bestows upon us. It is a divine gift and it's offered to you this morning that do not have it yet. For those that might be watching that have, that have never given their life over, you might know all kinds of stuff about who Christ is, but until you have come to the point in which you have emptied yourself of yourself, 
until you have come to the point of giving up your rights, confessing your sin and trusting upon the finished work of Christ. That's all offered. This morning really is a time of reflection, a time when we take a look at our own hearts and we see if the light of Christ resonates the revelation of his salvation. Does Jesus reign in your hearts this morning? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the marvelous offer of your grace. We thank you, Father, for a gift too wonderful for words. And Father, our desire is that you will reign in our hearts. We pray, Father, that you will take all of our weaknesses and turn them into your strength. And as we begin this new week, may your name be glorified in all that we do. And this is in the precious name of Jesus Christ we ask it. And all of God's people together said, amen.